the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We are grateful people that we get to come and hear your word. We didn't come to hear from a man or a woman. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. How good, Father, you are to us. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're our brothers and our sisters. We at no time think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one one field building, one kingdom, and that's not a man's, that's yours. So Lord, be blessed in your houses everywhere, and thank you for blessing us in this house with your presence. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say amen. amen. The other night, something was on my mind, and I found myself fretting over something in the middle of the night. Have you ever done that? Something wakes you up and, you know, you go to sleep really feeling good. And then all of a sudden, something wakes you up and you start thinking about something you shouldn't be thinking about. And Has anybody ever done that and you can't get back to sleep? Don't you just hate that? And you try to turn your brain off and it really boils down to you're really worrying about something you shouldn't be worrying about. I did something, which I, I do when that takes place, is I, when I can't sleep at night, I get up out of bed and, and I pray. And I just started walking around the room praying. Deborah was already down the other end of the hallway praying down there, I'm sure, somewhere. But I was walking around just praying out loud, bringing the issue before God. It wasn't but a few minutes had gone by when I had learned at that moment to cast the care onto God and I found a complete peace, got back into bed and fell asleep all night long. Next morning I woke up. When I woke up, I thought about you. And I thought, how sad it is that very few people know the principle that I just applied and it worked in my life. Most people stay up half the night worrying about something that means nothing. Have you ever noticed that what you worry about at night is really bigger at night than it is during the day? It's demonic. Knows what buttons to push and pushes them, sure enough, just so you'll feel crappy the next day. Rob your faith and rob your joy and rob your peace. But if you know what to do, it really helps you to be strong helps you to get that good rest you need so you can stay just powerful in the things of the Lord. Tonight, A Fearless Future. That's the title of the message is A Fearless Future. If you're going to have a future, let's have a future that's fearless. I see so many people over the years worrying about everything, in anxiety, not sleeping well, because the bottom line to all of that worry and everything else is something called fear or really a lack of faith. And we find ourselves just frustrated over stuff, fearing men, fearing what's taking place, fearing the economy, fearing politicians, fearing whether or not we're going to make it, fearing whether or not there's going to be money to pay the bills or a job next month or a, two years or where you're going five years from now. And we literally rob from the future the fears of the future and bring them into our existence today. And it just torments us to the place where we absolutely shackle ourselves so we cannot do and cannot be what God wants us to be. And it's time for us to break that spirit of fear that is off of every one of us and move on in the freedom that God has for us. Did you know that the Bible makes it very clear in 2 Timothy, first chapter, verse number seven, the Bible says, I have not given you the spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind, the Word of God says. 
We taught that to our children. Have you ever noticed a child who really doesn't know up from down, right from wrong, is oftentimes being, oh, you've got to get this, being conditioned to receive fear so that fear governs their life that will keep them from ever being great in the things of God because you'll never accomplish anything as you're always moving in a fear base. And little children who don't know good from bad, up from down, right from wrong, will wake up and absolutely find themselves just trembling in the middle of the night because of fear. And if you parents don't do something about it, and also what you do with them, you've got to do with yourself, you have got to at least memorize that scripture and come out. And when you walk, you can say, God has not given me the spirit of fear. Notice it's a spirit. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Did you know that most people that make bad decisions, let me say it again because I don't want you to miss it. Most people that make bad decisions, that go in bad directions, make bad decisions because they're in fear and will hasten to make a choice about something when they shouldn't have to. And God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but God has given us something else. Notice what it says. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. My kids used to repeat that back to us. Now I think it's interesting. They're teaching their children the same thing. They wake up in the middle of the night. They say to their children, listen, God hasn't, say it out loud. Say it out loud. Repeat it out loud. Repeat it out loud. I think it was one of the first verses our kids ever really memorized and put it to this day. They still speak that. There will always be a spirit of fear trying to stop you from your future. If you have a fearless approach to your future, you will have a future that is dynamic in Christ Jesus. But without a fearless approach to your future, you will be tormented and tortured all the time. In Matthew, Jesus speaks about it like this in the, the sixth chapter of Matthew. Let's take you back to verse 21. Let's pop it up. It says, it says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So all of a sudden he makes a statement, what's important to you becomes the very heartbeat of you. Let me say it again. What's important to you becomes your heartbeat. One more time, what become, what's important to you becomes literally your heartbeat. That's your treasure. That's what you think. So here comes God and like here comes a pastor and he wants to get you to change your attitude, change your outlook, get you to a place where you have a fearless future and all of a sudden because we can change your attitude, change your outlook on how you deal with life on a daily basis. Man, your future now is based on faith in God. And how far can you go when God backs you because there's nothing stopping you? Man, that's an amazing thing. Verse number 22 comes along and says it like this. He says, the lamp of the body is the eye, and therefore your eye is good. Your whole body will be full of light. So now he comes along and says, man, if you've got right thinking, the, your body's going to be right. It's going to be doing good. If you put your treasure in the right place, you're going to produce the right thing. If your body isn't doing well, you're not going to do well at all. Then he comes along, verse number 23, and he makes a statement that comes along. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And therefore, if light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So he comes along and says, man, here's life that's great, and here's life that's bad. Then he comes along. Let me just share this with you, if I may take you to verse number 25. Could you just pop up verse 25? It says, therefore, because all this stuff I just said to you. He's there, therefore I say to you, now here's the whole subject, do not what? Worry. I should have underlined the words, do not worry about your life. Why would you worry? Because we're in fear. Why are we worrying? Because we're in fear. We have insecurities. We don't know what's going on. We don't know how it's going to work. We don't know where it's coming from. It does not make sense. 
There's no logic to my life or where I'm going or what my future is all about. So I find myself stressed out. I find myself in anxiety. I find myself in worry. And the base of that worry is that word fear. Insecurity about what I am living in and where I'm living. And he says these words, do not worry about your life and what you will eat and what you will drink, nor about the body and what you will put on. Is it not more than food and the body more than clothing? In other words, life is what you got your heart fixed on. And then he comes along, verse number 27. Let's just pop forward to verse number 27. He says, which of you worrying can add one cubit to your stature? In other words, you worry all you want to. You be in fear, bring yourself in the middle of the night. Tell me what thing that you're going to worry about that's going to, 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 to add anything to your life. Does it help at all? No. What it does is darken your relationship with God. It puts you in a bad position, and all of a sudden it pollutes the eye, and you get yourself to the place which you're operating in darkness, all because of fear. The Bible makes it so, so clear on these things. In fact, these verses here in Matthew, I just want to just check it out with you just for a moment. In the sixth chapter, it also makes this statement in verse number 31. Therefore, again, he says, do not worry, saying, what shall you eat and what shall you drink and what shall you wear? Verse number 32, for after all of these things, the Gentiles, those, the word Gentile means people without God. Sometimes we people with God act like people that are without a God, is what he just said. And you and I, all of us are in here, sometimes we act, instead of acting like a people who have a God, we act like people who have no God. For your heavenly Father knows all of these things that you have need of. Verse number 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added onto you. So now all of this thing, he comes along and says, why do you worry? Why are you in fear? God knows you have need of these things. God will take care of you. And then he comes along and tells you, here's how to live life. Seek first God. If you seek first God, then God will add on everything that you need. But we don't. What do we do? We worry and we worry and we worry. We're in fear and it stifles us from ever going and being what God would have us to be. Is anybody listening? In fact, just for fun, I'll read verse 30. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So what are we worrying about? Why are we in fear? Does God know what we need? Yes. Does he promise to give it to us? Yes. Are we a people without a God? A Gentile group of people that have no God? Or do we have God? I mean, I just saw the people walk out of here. God just saved. My goodness, they have God from now on. They don't have to worry anymore. According to what the Bible says, there's a promise from God that when you seek him first, man, he will add the rest to your life. But you've got to listen to this. In order to get the rest of your life, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to seek him first. I found out something just thinking about the word fear. It's really caused by something called massive pressures of uncertainty. Massive pressures of uncertainty equals fear. When I am uncertain about something, and can I ask you something? The Gentiles are uncertain about something. But we that belong to God, remember the Gentiles is a, 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 a biblical description of people who are without God. People without God are people who worry and are frustrated and massive pressures of uncertainty. They're uncertain about their future and it brings them to fear. Let me explain this to you by showing you scripture. First, I want to show you how fear and a massive relationship. David, I'm going to use David as an illustration. Go with me to Psalms. Here's David. He is fleeing for his life. His son Absalom is chasing after him. 
He's leaving the city of David, Jerusalem. Can I just say so that he has had a long reign, a prosperous reign. He's doubled the economy of Israel. He's doubled the borders of Israel. People have prospered under his administration. He is a benevolent leader over Israel and a man of God. His son comes up, Absalom, and he's just on himself and he's just about himself and he just wants to drive the great David from the city. You don't have to drive David out. David just packs his stuff and walks out. But everybody is against David. Isn't that interesting? As much as he has blessed them, as much as he has helped them, as much as he has prospered them, as much as he has done great things. Have you ever done great things for people and you got it back from them? And you got frustrated, you know? You do something good for somebody. You know what I'm talking about. And you always say, I'm not doing anything good for anybody. They never appreciate it. Anybody ever been there besides me? Here's David who had years of that. And now he's leaving Jerusalem. And when he leaves Jerusalem, he makes a statement in this psalm. Third chapter, verse number six. I'm talking about massive. Think about how massive this, if you will, this um, pressure of uncertainty must have been. Verse six of the third chapter of Psalm says it like this. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. I mean, you talk about massive problems. That's a massive problem. Yet David makes a statement in the midst of his massive problem, which is greater than all of ours, I'll not be afraid. How can he do that? We're talking about massive. We're talking about pressures. Catch the pressures. Here's another one out of David's writings once again in Psalms 27, verse 3. It says this, Though an army may encamp against me, they're talking about pressures, my heart will not fear. The war shall rise against me. In other words, here's anything against you is pressure on you. So here is massive pressure of uncertainty. Here's Moses writing in Psalms 91. How about uncertainty? Watch this. I shall not be afraid of the terror by night, verse 5, nor the arrow that flies by day. So here's Moses coming along making this statement. I'll not be afraid by the terror by night and the arrow that flies by day. In other words, I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know what it is. It's a massive, if you will, a massive uncertainty coming at me. Pressures of uncertainty. I don't know where they're coming from. They come from different areas and I have an opportunity to be afraid or not be afraid. But they're not afraid, these great men of God, because of something. And you can learn that same principle tonight. And never, ever be afraid again if you put to work the principle. It's that simple. Massive pressures of uncertainty bring about fear. So how to deal with fear? Let's talk about it just for a few moments. There are four simple things I found in Scripture on how to deal with fear. Besides making a statement, of faith when you make that statement. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Well, man, I tell you, you need to know that. You need to believe that. But here, if I may say something, the number one thing I think you need to do is to get off the pressure and get on God. In order for you to be like David, in order for you to be like Moses, in order for you to get away from the fear that wants to stifle you and shackle you and keep you from the greatest future you could possibly ever imagine, you're going to have to get off the fear and get on God. When I got out of bed that night, I knew exactly what I was doing. I wasn't going to lay there and rehearse over and over and over and over and over in my mind. I knew it wasn't God that was trying to come upon me and I got up out of bed and I literally got off of the pressure and I got on God and when you get on God you got to get off the pressure 
That's why he said, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and then these things will be added back onto you. Here, all of us, sometimes what we do is we've got problems in our life, and we rehearse them. It's like somebody replaying a videotape on a constant basis, doing it over and over and over and over. You find yourself thinking about something two, three, four times. Stop. Get into a place and start talking to God about it, giving it to God, cast your cares on he that careth, get rid of it, know a fact that God's going to take care of you, speak it out loud that God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind, don't allow the mind to keep controlling the heart and bringing fear in that controls your future, you got to get off of it, in Psalms 118, if you got your Bible, go there, you need to underline this. In Psalms 118, verse number six says this, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Let me tell you something. Can I tell you something? I've always said it like this. I've been in ministry for a long time. Never, never look like we're ever going to do anything. We never have enough to do anything with. It's always by faith that we do what we do. You know, it's not like somebody's laid a golden goose out in, a, in the courtyard and we get to pick. We fight for every inch we have ever gotten in our lives. Uh, this never stops. It never will stop. Why? Because the Bible says the just shall live by faith and you'll never live by faith as long as you're in fear the just shall live by faith he says and what can man do can I tell you something when God's on your side who the flip gives a darn about what men can do what man um, uh, some man somewhere is going to have to go through God to get to you I'd like to know what man can go through God to get to you. And what is it that you have that God couldn't give back to you a hundred times more than what some man can take from you? Sometimes we just care about the little piddly stuff that we have and we fight so hard for the little piddly stuff. We fight, we're in fear, we're worried, we're frustrated. Can I tell you, some of you need to realize, listen, let him have it. God will give you a whole lot more. God's not finished with you. God's not finished with you. God is not broke. God's not down. God's not out. God says, look at you and say, well, you made a bad choice. You ruined your life. Can I tell you something? God's looking for people who do make bad choices, but know that life comes from him, not from the choices we make. I told Pastor David, and he started his church last week, I said to him, I want you, you know, he's doing what all young pastors do. Oh, we all did the same thing. We, you know, we, everything has to be perfect. Sound has to be perfect. The video overhead's perfect. The, the usher's got to look a certain way. The seats have got to be, everything's got to be perfect. Somebody comes, you want church to be perfect. Let me tell you what God's looking for. God, does this fit you? God has never looked for perfect. He's only looking for the imperfect who will trust him perfectly. And that's what this is all about. In other words, we, we think what we've got is so cool, it got to hold on to it, and if I lose that, I'm going to lose everything. Can I tell you something? Some of you need to lose it to realize that God is really in control, and that's when he comes through bigger than ever. We hold on to stuff, we worry about stuff that isn't worth worrying about. God gave it to you the first time, give it to you again. Are you, are you listening to me? You know, it's amazing. First thing you ought to do is get off the pressure and get on God. What can man do? Second thing, you got to trust the Lord. I mean, the bottom line, you got to trust the Lord. I'm going to read you out of Isaiah, the 12th chapter, verse number two. Behold, verse two says, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. You cannot trust and be afraid. 
They don't work together. If you are afraid or concerned or frustrated or have anxiety, don't tell me you have trust. Be honest with yourself. You don't have trust. You have trust when you don't give a flip about that, but you care about God. So you just give it all to God and say, here I am, God. If I have to sleep under the bridge, it won't be long before you give me the bridge and name the bridge after me. Because that's God. Remember, he's not looking for perfect. He's looking for imperfect that'll trust him in a perfect manner. And a lot of times we just miss that principle. Third thing we need to do is found that same verse. It says these words, for yea, the Lord is my strength. You gotta make him your strength. No, money isn't your strength. Your job isn't your strength. Your family isn't your strength. Your wife or husband isn't your strength. Your house isn't your strength. The society or social system isn't your strength. You gotta make God your strength. In other words, every day, man, this is about, not about me, not about what I have, not about what I don't have, it's about who he is. And when God becomes your strength, I'd like to know what's bigger, stronger in your life than him. Nothing. Let me try this side over here. Could you give me a nothing? I'd say, answer, you're supposed to say nothing. I'd like to know who's bigger and stronger in your life than him. See, that's just the way it is. So he becomes my strength. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how it's going to work. It doesn't make sense to me. It's the craziest thing in the world. Two plus two makes four. I know I've got to do two plus two to get four. Oh, no, you don't. Two plus two is whatever God wants it to be. It's called God math. And we trust too much in two plus two making four that we live our life by two plus two making four instead of two plus two is whatever God wants. It's whatever God says. This is not about two plus two makes four. God's not looking for the logical. Can you tell me how he parted the Red Sea? Tell me some logical reason. Why. Listen, you'd have to be on the Discovery Channel with a bunch of doctor's degrees uh, 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 working at some big name university giving some carnal answer about who God is. Let me tell you something. God's not logical. God just does what he wants when he wants and how he wants. You tell me how he walked on the water, raised the dead, opened the blind eyes. I'm telling you how he uh, took that which is nothing, made something out of it. How he fed out of ten, uh, five loaves and two loaves of bread and five fish. How he fed the multitude. Can you, that's not logical. Why do we always want to go to two plus two making four? It doesn't make sense. What makes sense is because you're not a Gentile, you belong to God, God's going to come in and take whatever it is you have and make it work. That's the way it is. So you got to make him your, your strength. First thing we're talking about is you got to get the pressure off and get God on. Second thing, you got to trust him. Third thing, you got to make him strength. Notice what it says in that Isaiah 12, verse 2. Pop it up again. Listen to this. My strength and my song. <laughs> if he's your song, then sing. Let me tell you something. Nothing chases the devil out of my house more than me singing. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, even he hates it. <laughs> Will you stop and think about it? What was he in heaven? He was the what? He was the song leader of heaven. When he hears me, he's got to get the hell out of my house. <laughs> and sometimes you just got to get nuts and start to sing. I'm not afraid of anything that the devil will throw at me. I've got God on my side, and he loves me. I'm a child of God, born under the Spirit of the Lord, and he loves me. All things are possible to him that believes. 
Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The devil hates it. It's not logical. Oh, but it feels so good when you do it. I want you to know something. When you go the radical mile, you get the radical results. Listen to me. Some people never do. Oh, it's just I'm not. I'm too sophisticated. I, I, I'm too educated. I, I, I'm too wealthy. I'm too small, smart. I'm too cool. I'm too classy. I, you need to start singing. Just start singing the word of God. Just start singing. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. Bless coming, bless going, and everything I put my hand to, I shall prosper. Whoa, yeah. Now, come on now. Come on now. I know some of you are thinking I'm part black. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know he was black. <laughs> I tell you, being at the Rock is fun, isn't it? Yeah. Woo. We have fun in this place. The bottom line for all of us, four things. I didn't put them in one, two, three, four tonight. You know why? Because I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll repeat it for you. Number one, get off the pressure and get on God. Number two, trust him. Number three, make him your strength, not your checkbook, not the world around you, not your feelings. Amen. Number four, sing. Make him your song. Make him your song. I don't think God cares that we have lousy voices and can't carry a tune. I don't think he cares one bit. The fact that I did it Here's the results of what I did and what I got. Can I read you one last verse? Proverbs, this is such a cool verse. The third chapter, verse 23, I talked about it a couple of weeks ago. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down, and your sleep will be sweet. Why? Because you didn't worry about a thing. God is good. And that's the results of not worrying. If you stay awake all night long, you are not in faith. Are you following me? We do so many crazy things over and over and over again, which indicates we're really not in faith. We're putting our trust somewhere else besides faith. Four things. Get off the pressure. Get on God. Put your trust in the Lord. Make him your strength. Make him your song. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> if, if you haven't called upon his name and given God all of your heart and given God all of your life, let's don't go another minute without giving you an opportunity to do that. There's those of you that are in here. You need to hear me. If you should die tonight, somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. If you're not saved, you're going to go to hell. And the only way to get saved is you've got to give God all of your heart and all of your life. That's what we mean about calling on the name Jesus, Jesus. And tonight, there's those of you that are in here, you know him in your head. There's no doubt or you wouldn't be here. Worst question you could ever ask an American is do you know Jesus? Everybody knows Jesus. Christmas, Easter, resurrection, baby in the manger. We all know that know about Jesus my goodness but that's not what we're talking about as head knowledge we're talking about you tonight right now before we go any further giving Jesus all of your heart giving Jesus all of your life listen to me Jesus said this to a great guy by the name of Nicodemus Nicodemus was probably better in his lifestyle than all of us 
He was a keeper of the law, memorized the scripture. How many of you have done that? Quoted the scripture. How many of you have done that? Debated the scripture. Sang the scripture. How many of you have done that? Wore ecclesiastical robes, was a leader of his church, the synagogue. He took care of the poor, fed the poor. I mean, this was a great guy. And Jesus comes to him and doesn't say you're going to love heaven. Heaven's waiting for you because you've done all these great works. You know what he does? He comes to Nicodemus. He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. If you're going to make it to heaven, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, man, I don't know how to do that. What am I supposed to do? Crawl back in my mother's womb? What are you talking about? And he said these words to him. He says, you know, what spirit is spirit? What flesh is flesh? You're going to have to give God spiritually all of your heart and give God all of your life. And you know, you know it. You know you haven't done that. You know you have him in your head. You know you might have been a pretty good person and even a bad person isn't the issue. The issue is whether or not you will call upon the name of Jesus tonight before we go any further and give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. If that's you and you know you need to do that, all I'm going to ask you to do is something simple. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and then put it right back down. Just let me see it. Thank you. There's one. Anybody else? Thank you. There's another one back over here. Thank you. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. There's another one. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's another one. Another one. There's four, five, six. Thank you. Seven, eight, nine. Thank you. Ten. Go ahead. You can put your hand down. I see it. Anybody else? There's 10, 11 of you. Thank you. Anybody else? Real quick. Real quick, anybody else? Anybody else? Way up on top, thank you. There's uh, 12, thank you. Anybody else, real quick, just saying to yourself, you know, I, here's what you're saying to yourself. You don't know what to do. All you know is you need to get right with God. There's another one, 12. And if that's you, let's get right with God before we go any further. Is that all right? There's 12 wise people. Anybody else? Don't clap. Where's 13? Where's 13? Anybody else, real quick? Let's just go for God. Thank you. There's 13 right there. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's, is there 14 that you're saying to yourself, I know I need to get right with God. That's you, 14. Thank you, 15. Thank you. Back over here, 16. Thank you. Thank you. Is that you, Robin? No, you're just praising God, raising your hand. 16, 17. Anybody else, real quick? Anybody else, real quick? There's 17. If there's 17, don't you know there's 52? <laughs> no, if there's 17, where are you? 18. You know you need to get your hand up. Anybody else? Before, before we miss this. Anybody else? There's 17 wise people. 17. 17. All 17 of you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff right now. You raised your hand. You're serious about God. Get your stuff. It's okay. No, no weird stuff goes on. You couldn't be in a safer place. I want you to get out of your seat. The people will let you out if you're in the middle of the aisle. This is not like you're going to knock over their popcorn in a show. And they'll let you out. And then get in the aisle and meet me right here in front, all 17 of you. And anybody that didn't raise their hand, but you know you should have, you can come too. Just bring a friend, bring your stuff. Come on up here. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, come on, it's good. Oh, they're coming, give them a hand. Come on, you can come too, just go. like there's a lot more than 17 of you. Anybody else that needs to come, this is a time to come. This is a time to come. Think about it this way. If you can't come forward for Jesus in a safe place like this, how are you ever going to serve him on the job? 
outside the building, in the store. How are you ever going to serve him with your relatives and friends? You know, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you as mine before my Father. He goes on to say, if you do not confess me, I will not confess you as mine. So if you're bashful and holding back, this is not the time to do that. Just run up here real quick. All of you in front, thank God you've come. I want you to look to your left, see this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. He's going to do three things. Going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. That's kind of neat because you got to invite him in. He's going to give you some free stuff about now you're a Christian, what to do next. I mean, after you pray, Jesus is going to come into your life. You're going to be saved. Now you want to know, what does Jesus expect of me? This free stuff will tell you that. Thirdly, he's going to introduce you a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. They're friends. We just give away friends here. Why? Because we want you to meet them before church service. They will pray with you. They will go over some scripture with you. Now listen to this. Why? So you can get strong in Jesus and not go back, fall through the cracks. We don't want you to go back into the world and fall through the cracks. Remember, this can't be, this can't be some emotional moment. This has got to be a serious relationship. You're giving God all your heart and remember all your life. That doesn't mean just for a moment and then go back doing the same stuff. Let us help you by getting a spiritual personal trainer. Only takes a few moments. They'll let you come right back in the church service. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over that way. Isn't God good?